Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, which is going to be our text as we are studying uh, the spiritual warfare. Uh, we are looking this morning now at the uh, breastplate of righteousness. And so as you're turning, I just kind of want to get us into uh, an idea of where we're at before we even read the text, because we've been studying in Ephesians. For those of you who've been with us, we understand that uh, um, Ephesians is a very encouraging and uplifting book, and we see in the very first few chapters, as a matter of fact, all the way up until chapter 4, um, we're seeing all these things that God has given us, and we're, we're seeing every spiritual blessing from the heavenlies. We're accepted in the Beloved. We, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. The mystery of the gospel has been revealed to us. In Ephesians chapter 2, we see that salvation has come by grace. It's not of works. It has been given as a gift of God. And we, we see that we have, we have looked at the unsearchable riches of Christ, and we're to show the manifold wisdom of God. God has ordained us to do that. And so there are a lot of things that God has given. There's a lot of power, if we will tap into it, that we have for the kingdom. And I believe in this book, what God has ordained through the life of Paul, is that we might understand understand that we're not to get cocky with this. We're not, to, we're not to get to a point until we're arrogant with what God has given us. And Paul is telling us in, in God's word in chapter 6, is, what he's telling us is this, that this Christian life is not something that is a life of ease. This is going to be a struggle. The Christian life is a battle. Friends, if you are considered to be a born-again Christian and it's not a struggle, you're probably not. Or you're not where you're supposed to be. The Christian life is a struggle. So as we're looking at this text, he's, he's telling us as we talked last week about how to prepare ourselves for this battle with the armor. And last week we looked at the belt of truth that we understand the truth of the word of God. We're, we need to be able to gird up our loins to be ready at all times and put our trust in the truth of his word. And this morning we're looking at, as I said, the, the breastplate of righteousness. So I said shield of faith earlier. I misspoke. Breastplate of righteousness. In chapter 6... In verses 13 and 14, it says this, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. In verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. All right, we're going to jump into our text this morning as we just read. And I do kind of have a question I want to pose to you to think about. In all the spiritual armor, many of you have studied all of it, I want you to think in your mind, and don't jump up or raise your hand, but which piece is the most important? We have all these pieces, and trying to think which piece would be the most important. If you had to only preach, let's say you're a pastor, and you could only get to preach on one, you know, which one would you preach on? And, uh, and looking at that and thinking about it, we see in the verses, it says, Therefore, put on the whole armor of God. And I don't think there's any one piece, I'm, in fact, I'm quite certain, that's more important than the other. I believe that they all work in tandem. And any one that's missing would be detrimental to the battle in which we're fighting. If I pose this question to you, which tire on your car is most important? Would you have an answer? You pretty much need all four tires. No matter which one blows out or you don't put on, the, the, the point is your car's not going to go anywhere. There's a thing in the scientific community called irreducible complexity. And irreducible complexity is this. You get to a point how something operates and you can take nothing else away from it or it will no longer op operate. And you say, where are you going, Pastor Steve? Hang on with me. A mousetrap is the illustration used for irreducible complexity. It's used in an argument in apologetics for uh, uh, evolution, but we're not going to go there. But I want you to think with me, this mousetrap. If you take any part of a mousetrap... And I'm talking about the ones that I grew up with, not these new fancy ones, but any part of a mousetrap, and you remove it, it won't work. If you remove the spring, there's nothing when the mechanism is kicked to or tripped in order to smash the little mouse's head. If you remove the base, there's nothing to connect it to. If you move the little staple that holds the other end of the spring, the spring won't set. If you remove the mechanism that holds the cheese, that mechanism also holds the lock that holds the spring. It won't work. If you take off the spring, it's just a design and a decoration of something. It will not work. Every piece of that mousetrap is an absolute necessity if you're going to use it as a mousetrap. As we're looking at the spiritual armor, we are at irreducible complexity. Every piece of this armor is needed. Every piece of this armor is equally important. And if we remove one piece of that armor from it, you might as well not go to battle. You're going to die. You have to have all of it. 
And so this morning, as we are looking at the breastplate of righteousness, it is not more important than any of the other. But I do believe that we, as a people, need to hear and understand this piece more so than the other. But I believe, because I believe that this is where we are lacking in our faith today, in our nation, and around the world, in the breastplate of righteousness. And so as we're talking about this breastplate that Paul is probably attached to a prisoner as we looked last week, when he's looking at this Roman soldier, he would see one of two things, either a heavy piece of cloth or leather, and they would take hooves of animals and horns and mount it to that piece of leather or cloth in order to stop an attack from the enemy. If a dart or an arrow, or a sword were to come, perhaps if you were unaware, you could parry that shot with the vest that you were wearing, this breastplate that was there. If we look at another idea of what we usually see and think of, there was also the full metal piece, a breastplate of armor. And it would come from the thighs all the way up to the neck and cover the individual and be more form-fitting to the soldier in order that he had a little bit of room to move. And looking at that armor, and I just spit all over someone, I beg your pardon, and looking at that armor... We have to see what the purpose of that armor would be for the soldier. And this is what the purpose of the armor is. To protect the important organs of the body, mainly the heart and the bowels or the organs. And that's what the breastplate did. Without it, you would go down in battle. It was very necessary. And so as we're seeing this illustration that God gave to Paul for us, even to this day, to understand, we need to understand the importance of what that breastplate is protecting. The heart is the mind. Especially in that day when you talked of the heart, the heart was the mind where the seat of the will was. In Scripture we see that the heart, it says this, these things about the heart. As a man thinks, so is he. From the heart proceed evil thoughts. Jesus said it's not what goes in that defiles, but it's what comes out. And so it's the heart of the matter. And this breastplate of righteousness is what is protecting our heart. And basically our heart is our minds because our minds tell everything else what they need to know and how to think. Our emotions are controlled by the knowledge in which we hold in our minds. And so remember this as we're looking at this piece of armor, that we are looking at something that is protecting our hearts, our minds. But it also protects what the Jews would know as the bowels. We read in Scripture in different places the bowels, and we need to understand it's more than just guts. It means something a little deeper. As the heart is the mind which controls the will, the bowels are considered the emotions of a being. And so let me explain it to you this way. Have you ever been, let's say when you were a kid, or perhaps at work and you were older, and you did something that was really, really dumb, and you got caught? Remember that feeling in the pit of your stomach? Okay, feelings. Okay, let me back up. For some of you older ones, you remember back in the 20s when you first had that boyfriend or girlfriend and they came around the corner and when you saw them, those little butterflies that came up in your stomach, do you remember those? Been a long time, hasn't it? <laughs> you remember those butterflies? That, that, that's the pit of your stomach. Did you ever hear someone say, I just, I just feel it in my gut, man. That gut feeling that something's wrong. Those are the emotions. And so as we look at this armor, that's, it's talking about covering uh, the parts of our body. And we're looking at this, this breastplate of righteousness. We have to understand that as we're looking at it in an illustration, it is covering our mind, our will, and our emotions. It is protecting that from the ev evil one. And it has to be protected. Remember, as a man thinks, so is he. Everything that comes into our mind has to process and it comes out. Remember when... You, when we were kids, there was that little song, input, output, whatever goes in must come out, because computers were new then, because I'm old, and so input, output, it can only come out if it goes in, and whatever you put in bad, it's going to come out. This is pretty much the mindset of what we're talking about. And the heart is the mind, the will, and the emotions. And the battle starts in the mind. Remember in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, But be ye not conformed to this world, but instead be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. As believers in Jesus Christ, our mind needs to be re renewed until we have put on the mind of Christ. It needs to become new. It needs to become fresh. And my favorite 
Bible scholar John MacArthur said this quote, and I thought it was so fitting. If you protect your thoughts and feelings from Satan, you are impregnable. Because that's where it all begins. As we looked at two weeks ago, as Lucifer came in the garden, and he got a hold of Eve, and he got her to first doubt God's word, then deny God's word, then disobey God's word, then disengage from God's word. This is where the battle lies in the mind. This is why as we're looking at spiritual warfare, we often picture men that are huge and buff, unlike me, and in good shape going to battle. But in this battle, some of the, the best hardened uh, soldiers that I've seen are women in their 70s and 80s who have a daily prayer life and have a relationship with Him. And they have guarded their hearts and their lives for all these years because the war is in the mind. It's in the will. It's in the emotions. It's not in the physical being. And so as we're looking at this breastplate of righteousness, we need to understand what we're fighting with. But here is what is very confusing to the believer. What does... The breastplate of righteousness represent in our life. What righteousness? What, what are we putting on and protecting? There are only three choices that we have, and we have to figure out what this text means because it's so important. Remember, irreducible complexity. We have to understand and know this. So the first thing we're going to look at this morning is positional righteousness. Positional righteousness, which is the word imputed Imputed righteousness. Yes, it's a big churchy word. Let me explain. Imputed means this. Something has been accredited to your account. If you want to test it out, this is how it works. You go down to CNB, down here, the bank, and just say, I would like to place $2,000 in the account of Stephen Pollard, Pastor Stephen Pollard. And then when you hand him that money, that money lands in my account. You can go try it. Wait till money, the bank's over. Okay. That, that is crediting my account. See, I did nothing for that to land there, but someone else did something in which my account is accredited. Now, it's not that person's account, it's mine, and I didn't work for it, but it was imputed into my bank account. If you don't believe it'll work, try it Monday. I'll give you my routing numbers. Okay. <laughs> imputed righteousness. So this is the righteousness that has been given to us through Jesus Christ at the moment of salvation. With this imputed righteousness, think with me, we're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. How do we put on and take off something that has been imputed? In that bank account that you're going to put $2,000 in money, I can't impute, I can't do anything with what you imputed. I can't change the numbers. I can't even stop you from doing it. Not that I would try. I couldn't stop you. It's an imputed. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says, For there is none righteous, no, not one. And listen to how he says it. It's as if he is in front of a group of people, so there's none righteous. And some clown says, I am. He says, no, not even one. There is no one that is righteous. And the following verse is, There's none that even seek after God or search for him. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is positional imputed righteousness. It is righteousness that we have because of our position in Jesus Christ. Are you following me? Fast forward to the end of the book, Revelation chapter 20. We see the great white throne judgment. And all these people are standing there at the great white throne judgment. In those verses, it talks about how they will stand. The dead will stand, small and great, before God. And in that, in that set of verses, you can write these down. I'm not lying to you. It starts around verse 11 in chapter 20 of Revelation. It says, And the books were opened, and each one gave an account to what was written in the books. And whoever was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Follow that wording closely. It's the judgment. Everyone who stands before God that are judged out of that book are cast in the lake of fire. None make it. None righteous. No, not one. There is a group that make it. And it's mentioned in those verses when it says, He who was not written, hear me, in the Lamb's book of life. So those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, follow me please, have a positional righteousness that was imputed by God. He accredited our account with His righteousness through His death and the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been made redeemed. We have been made righteous. And when God sees you, He sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ, when you're repentant of your sin. And that's all He sees. It's imputed righteousness given. Psalm 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, 
so far as He removed our transgressions from us. We cannot put on or take off imputed righteousness. If we are saved, it was given, it's there forever, it covers past, it covers present, it covers future. So in this text, as we look at the the breastplate of righteousness, it cannot be the positional righteousness that we have in Jesus Christ. Are you following me? Because this is deep stuff. We have positional righteousness, and then the next one we're going to look at is personal righteousness. Some of those verses I just mentioned, Romans 3.10. There is none righteous, no Not one. For the wages which we deserve of sin is death. Our own righteousness is not sufficient. Has never been. Never will be. The Pharisees thought in Jesus' time that they had the righteousness of the law that they needed in order that they might be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that's why, do you remember when Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, He's giving it? And he, he, he does the first part and, and he starts rolling on. And I'm sure the people were aghast because he said, Assuredly, I say unto you, unless your righteousness is higher than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine the draws dropping in that crowd? Because the Pharisees were a sect that were so legalistic that every jot and every tittle was taken care of to the T. And Jesus is saying, you've got to be better than them in order for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. Basically, none of you are able to make it. There is no righteousness within yourself that can make this cut. There is nothing that you can do to achieve it. There is nothing that you can do to attain it. It is impossible. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, comes to Jesus by night. John chapter 3. You remember this story? And, And Nicodemus starts to talk to him. And Jesus interrupts him. He says, Nicodemus, in order for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be born again. He didn't say you've got to do these good works. He didn't say you've you got to do this right. You've got to quit lying or stealing. You've got to be born again. What you have, Nicodemus, must die. And I must come alive in you. Because my righteousness is what will get you there. Your righteousness, no matter how hard you work, will never, ever do it. That's why in Matthew 5, the same thing, Sermon on the Mount. He's preaching. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now hear me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now think logically with me. If you believe that you are righteous, how often are you going to hunger and thirst and desire for it? You're not. Just like me at home. I'm never going to go hungry at home. I'm never going to desire that I have to have something to eat because my house is full of food. I might want something a little different once in a while. I might want some chocolate, but I I will never be hungry. There will never come to a point, unless it's my own fault in my home, where you find me shriveled up in a corner, starved to death because my house is full of food. Missy fills it for me. She's a good lady. Never go hungry. I have no need or desire. But in our lives... In righteousness, there has to be a hunger and a desire. And the only way to have the hunger and the desire is to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have nothing within ourselves in which to be righteous with. And until we get to that point, we will never, ever be redeemed in Jesus Christ. Never. Our churches are full of people who've taken the wide road and the wide gate. And they're saying, I'm doing well because I'm better than everybody else. And they will stand before God and He will judge them out of the book where their name is not written, but everything they did is written. And they'll be judged according to their works. And they will be damned for eternity in hell. And it's not because they were so bad. We all were because their righteousness was on their own instead of trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's the only way. As we're looking at this personal righteousness, I want you to turn with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, the author of Ephesians also authored Philippians, their epistles, their letter to the churches inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And I want to read these verses for you and then we're going to pick them apart a little bit. Paul says in Philippians 3, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for to me, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilation, for we are circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also may have confidence in the flesh. And let me stop. He's talking about people who are adding work onto salvation. That's circumcision or the Jews telling the people, if you come to Christ, you're not saved unless you're circumcised. And he's telling them, you are circumcised in your heart. It is no longer anything by works, it's by grace. So here we are in the last part of verse 4. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, 
I more so. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But the things were gained to me, I have counted lost for Christ. Yes, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, hear me please, if you if you zoned out in all the words, hear these, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or I am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid a hold of for me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As we're reading these verses in Philippians, we're saying that Paul is saying, if you want to rely on your own righteousness, let me tell you something. And Paul is very bold as he speaks. If there is anybody on the planet that should be able to do this, Paul says, it should be me. And he starts laying out his pedigree. He was a Hebrew among Hebrews. He was born of the tribe of Benjamin, favorite of the twelve. Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, was who Judah went with when they reconstructed Israel, reconstituted it. It's a big deal. He said, I was circumcised. Not only circumcised, but on the exact correct day, on the eighth day. He was a Hebrew among Hebrews. He was schooled as a Pharisee, a sect that were so strict that we just talked about. And what he didn't mention is he was trained under the feet of Gamaliel. He was the perfect picture. In zealousness, he said, I even persecuted the church because it went against what he thought the law was. And he's saying, if there was anybody in a room today that could claim their righteousness is good enough, it is me. And in the later verses, I don't know what version you have, here it says garbage, but some of them say dung or manure. I count it all of manure as manure for the righteousness that I have found in God through Jesus Christ. He realized he had nothing to offer. Nothing. Many will stand that day and like that wide road, relying on themselves, get to that point and sadly be surprised that that righteousness just will not do it. So we see two kinds of righteousness that cannot possibly fit the righteousness that is being talked about in the spiritual armor. Because the first set of righteousness that we talked about was given by God and is permanent. You can't take it on, you can't put it off, you can't prepare it. The second one is non-existent. Personal righteousness doesn't even exist. It's a myth. We can't put it on or take it off. So you're probably thinking, well, what in the world is this scripture talking about? And we should. It's difficult. But there is something. And the third thing we're looking at this morning is practical righteousness in our lives. Holy living of the believer. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 says, I beseech you to abstain from freshly, fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Now hear me so you understand what, I, what we're looking at in the scripture. We have this breastplate of righteousness to protect what? Our minds. Because it's the heart, the seat of the will. And all Satan wants to do is get a little pinhole or a little foothold inside of that armor to get through to start working in our minds to slowly twist us and pervert us. He wants to twist and pervert our affections to long after, to lust after, to feel for the wrong things. To slowly erode our morality until it's completely diminished. To get us where we're so buried in sin that we don't even know it's sin anymore. And we turn on our television sets and it's a mockery and we laugh it's sin. We go to the movie theaters and see movies that completely and ob object to the Word of God and we come out after paying for it and eating popcorn highly entertained to the point to where we cannot point to anyone else's sin that is a brother in Christ because ours is so far gone that if we point to that sin, they'll point to ours and so we travel further and further and further away from God and most of the time we're not even aware that it's happening. A pinhole in the dam. It just doesn't seem like a big deal. 
Just a little trickle until that water starts to erode that dam and the entire dam breaks. And before we know it, this pinhole that seems so insignificant is everything and it has destroyed our walk with Jesus Christ and any possibility of having fruit in our lives. This is his game. This is why we are to put on the righteousness of Christ. This breastplate of righteousness of holy living. Slowly and methodically, without that piece by piece, he will destroy us. I talk about my dogs all the time. You guys think I'm one of those crazy cat people except with dogs. But I, I thought four years ago, wasn't we had dogs? I wouldn't have them. And here was the main reason. It's because I've been in the houses, and I may have talked this, about this before with you, but it always bothered me. You walk into a house and people have dogs, and it smells like dog. And they lived in the house so long that they don't know it smells like dog, and they think it's normal. And I don't want to be that guy. So I didn't have dogs for years, because I know that slowly but surely, you or I will get used to that smell, and someone's going to come over, and they're going to smell a dog, and I'm not even going to know it, and I'm going to look dirty and nasty, and I didn't want that to happen. Satan finds these little places. Hear me with these fiery darts we'll read about later. Just in the right place. Just to squeeze in and to make comfortable and normal until we normalize to the point to where it's not even an issue anymore. Each one of us, he knows which part, which sin, which thing to just tweak. In our society today, every time a new television show comes out, third episode, there's a homosexual. Because Satan is dumbing down our senses to it, even in the circle of believers. It's just okay, it's normal. Until finally we have seen it so many times, it's okay. Years ago they started with adultery and fornication. We're past that now. We have Christians have graduated. That's not even an issue. We let it in our churches. It's open and rampant. We'll put you in membership. But don't be a homosexual because there's a line. Well, don't worry. Because in 20 years, that line's going to be mushed and blurred just like the first line as we continue to go step by step away from the righteousness that God has given us. And without that righteousness, we are hopeless and helpless to reach the community with Jesus Christ. But we go on day after day chasing the same things to where Satan has changed our wills to the point that we're chasing the world instead of we're chasing the word of God and the people around us are being destroyed and we don't even know it's happened. As we grab this breast plate of righteousness it is like and I'm stealing this illustration from my favorite author John MacArthur like when you go to the restaurant at Burger King or wherever it may be and you sit your child in the high chair and they give you that little plastic thing that flips over their head and protects them from their food and this is the practical armor that most of us today are using in order that we might be right with God and expect all the other pieces to work friends hear me they will not work and we today want everything that Jesus has to offer, but we're not willing to give him what he demands in order to get it. And he demands righteous living. Now, he did cleanse us from our sin as believers. For those of you who are truly saved, there was a point that he cleansed us. But every day we need to come to him and we need to repent and we need to renew that relationship with him. It is a work in progress, constant I know they told you in VBS and in the Southern Baptist Church that it wasn't. They just told you that all you had to do was accept Jesus in your heart and come to church once week and everything was going to be all right. They lied to you. They lied. Satan has slid in the easyism of the gospel just like in this thing and lied. And now we have scores of people who will never know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. My best friend that I've ever had that wasn't a Christian back home. I worked with him. And I, I explained the gospel to him and I witnessed to him because I love him and I still love him. He told me, I've already done that. I said, really? Because some mealy mouth worship leader in the church there told him, and he's Catholic, that if he said this prayer, that God would come into his heart and he would be okay. So he said this prayer. And in his mind, from the Catholic background, he said, he didn't need to hear anything from me. So the good work that they thought they were doing, they completely destroyed in his life because he doesn't want to hear it because he's already saved on his way to hell. And I love him to death. And there's nothing I could do because he won't listen. Slowly and methodically, he's eroding. The easyism of the gospel is destroying the work. 
I illustrate to you this way. We want what Jesus has, but we're not willing to give what he demands. I went to the doctor. I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm, I might cut this off the internet. Most of you know I'm in chronic pain every day. For about how many years, Missy? Ten? Evidently, I'm a chronic forgetter. I thought it was about four. Chronic pain. Well, as I'm reading and understanding, I, I begin to become a little bit depressed, like medically something's wrong. And so I went to the doc, and I said, Doc, I've been pain every day, and I thought, maybe, I thought I was just a weakling, you know, or a sissy or something, but you know, there's something wrong because I've got this depression thing going on. Can you give me something for it? And so this is what he said. Well, I can give you something, but first we're going to need to send you to a psychologist and maybe a psychiatrist and get you some therapy. And I said, I'm good. And the moment I said it in the office, he probably thinks that I'm more than depressed. He probably thinks I've lost my mind because as soon as I said it, I went, (laughs) and he doesn't know because what I just did in his office was I sat across from myself in my office here. So many people, all these things are going on and you give them the answers out of the word of God and they realize, oh, it's going to take effort from me? I'm out, dude. I can accept Jesus in a prayer, but I am not going to daily die to him. I am not going to give everything there is to give to him. That's out of the picture. Give me a pill. I'll give you one hour a week. You give me a pill and I'll be his. Other than that, I'm out. I'm on a different sermon. (laughs) As we're looking at our lives as Christians, shield, sword, the belt, the garb, the shoes, the helmet. Folks, if we don't get this one, I'm wasting my time studying it. You're wasting your time listening to it because it means nothing. Because this is paramount. Paramount in the life of the believer. If we continue on in the way that we're going, with no practical righteousness, we will never attain what God had desired for us to attain. And back to Philippians that we talked about a moment ago. Paul, when he's talking about a situation, he says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. This is Paul the apostle, that I may know him. (laughs) How much better do you think Paul knows Jesus Christ than than we do? (laughs) That I might be conformable unto his death. Paul in Philippians was about ready to die for his faith. So what does he mean, be conformable to his death? If we look at the words of Jesus, he said, if any man will come after me, Luke 9, 23, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And Paul was still longing and, and pushing forward. It says in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the high word call in Christ Jesus. He was still pressing for the mark at the end of his life where he's about to die in Philippians. How much more do we need to be pressing on for the practical righteousness of Jesus Christ in our life? This isn't the beginning of the race or the end of the race. This is the beginning. And he's given us all these blessings out of the heavenlies. And friends, I'm being real with you. We'll stand before him one day. And he's going to say, this is all I gave you. What would you do with it? We're going to be so embarrassed. Pressing on toward the mark as Paul in practical righteousness. As we put the armor on, this breastplate of righteousness is paramount in the armor. This morning, would you consider forgetting everybody else in the room and think, is this the breastplate that I'm wearing this morning as believers? Those of you who are here who are trusting on your own righteousness to attain, would you consider this morning taking that step of faith and trusting in his righteousness and giving your life to him? Not saying a magical prayer of I accept you, repenting from your sin, taking off your righteousness and putting on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This morning, would you consider doing that?